Well, I was surfing around today and looking at videos, and I ran across the video that caused me to buy a remote ID module back on May 30th. This video came out just a couple of days before this. And you can see right here at the 1014 mark, if you forward it up, I'll put a link to this in the uh, description. Uh, the gentleman making this video really talks about how much he wants one of these modules to play with. After all, people are going to have to be buying them, and it's his job to teach them how they work. <laughs> so I'll let you look at that, and I think I'll tell you a little sea story. What the hell? I was looking through my cruise books yesterday and decided to give you guys a sea story. Tell you a little sea story. First, I'll set the stage. This picture is the AE shop and the AT shop. The aviation electronics technicians are on the top and the aviation electrical technicians are on the bottom. We shared a shop. Uh, you'll see my smiling butt right there in the second row. Second person in dark hair, mustache. So that was from the first cruise. This one's from the 1975 cruise, and I didn't even remember being in this picture because I thought I got off the ship to be discharged before they took the pictures. But I'm the fifth one from the left on the top row, very last one on the top row there. That's the avionics shop on top and the line crew on the bottom. This one explains to you why I'm numbering my airplanes the way I am. Right there, 751. That was our second aircraft. 750, 751, 752, and 753 were our four aircrafts. My numbers go a little bit higher than that, but that's why I'm numbering them that way. Just kind of an homage back to my old squadron. And there's a portion of one of the stations in the back. There were three. That doesn't quite show the whole station. And it certainly doesn't show any on the other side of the scope. You can't see much that's going on over there. That's a light pin, by the way. It's not a resistive pin or anything like that. Back in those days, it was literally, there was a lit grid on the scope, and that pin picked up where on the grid it was being pointed. Anyway, there were three of those stations in the back, and pilot and co-pilot in the front, separated by a compartment with hordes and hordes of high-level electronics in it. I, I kind of did enjoy that job, really did. So that's kind of an overview of me and the squadron. Let's get to the sea story for the 1973 cruise. You're going to love this one. On June 1st, 1973, we pulled into Cannes, France for a little liberty. And any time we pull into port, uh, we always anchor out. We don't uh, tie up at a pier anywhere in the Mediterranean. We do uh, in the United States and Norfolk, but we didn't in the Mediterranean. And the sailors always have anchor pools. We had about 7,000 men on the ship. And everybody gives a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, whatever the asking price is for anchor pools. And what those pools are is you write down a time that you think the ship is going to anchor when you pull into port. And whoever hits it on the head gets all the money. Now, we never had any full ship anchor pulls. It was more or less your division, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, doing these things. So they were all over the ship. Wish they'd been shipwide because 7,000 times $1 means you win $7,000 if you hit it. And if everybody's putting in $2, that means you win $14,000. If they're putting in 10, that's $70,000 for hitting an anchor pull. Well, I was walking through the hangar bay as we pulled in, and they always come over the 1MC and state exactly when the ship anchors. That's what everybody's waiting on. So I was walking through the hangar bay, and all of a sudden I heard, the ship is anchored, which is pretty good. Uh, the only problem was is 
few seconds later, the one MC shouted out, the ship is adrift. We're only like a thousand yards off of shore. An aircraft carrier. That's not too good. Uh, a few seconds later, the one MC blared out, the ship is anchored. That was the second time it was anchored that day. Uh, I didn't win the pull. I don't know who did. I don't know if both um, anchorages paid out or what that day. That's 50 years ago. I, I don't remember much of that. I do remember the event because it was quite an event. went on for days. As you can see in the description there, it says lost on 1 June at 1609, about 2,000 yards offshore. Okay, 2,000. Still pretty damn close. In 240 feet of water, one starboard anchor uh, with 180 fathoms of chain attached. If found, please contact the Navy salvage ship USS Opportune. Well, we sat there for two days till the Opportune could steam to where we were. It took them about two days to come from whatever port they were in to get over there to Cairns and anchor up near us. The problem was, is this recovery just went on and on and on. I've got Super 8 videos of it someplace. If I can ever find them, I'll show them. Uh, the poor old Opportune uh, did find our anchor, did find the chain, did attach to that chain, but bless her little heart, I sat there, as you can see in the upper right picture of the four, you can see all sorts of people in the catwalk and safety nets there, skylarking and just watching what's going on with the opportune. And the problem was is she couldn't get more than two links of chain out of the water before she started going under. Uh, I was watching that first day, the two Two links came up, third link started to come up, and the ship started going down instead of the chain moving out of the water. Well, they kind of smoked things over for a day or two after that because she was the biggest salvage ship the Navy had, biggest one in the Mediterranean. Uh, they were trying to figure out what to do. She just wasn't big enough to even pick the chain off the bottom, much less the anchor. So the final solution, you can kind of see in the big picture in the bottom, there's a rope coming out of the starboard anchor port. She's anchored by the front anchor. There's three of them, actually, a port of starboard and a bow anchor. They dropped the bow anchor pretty quick that day. The picture in the upper left shows them rigging that rope to try to get it all back around that windlass and be able to use our ship's windlass to pull that anchor and chain up because the opportune just couldn't do it. It just wasn't going to happen with her. And you can see in the bottom left picture, they could only get like two links a chain out of the water before our guys went down there and rig ropes to the chain and then our windless system started pulling that anchor up and back into the chain locker. I've also got Super 8 movies someplace of the damage that was done in the forecastle. Those windlasses and uh, that chain is up in the forecastle of the ship. It's where a lot of ceremonies take place in front of the where the chains go out, etc., etc. It's the most forward and highest compartment in a ship, the forecastle. And those chain links weigh 365 pounds apiece. And when it came whipping out of that chain locker up through past that windlass and out the ship, it took out one inch thick steel bulkheads all through that room. Uh, you can't see the destroyed bulkheads in this picture, but you could if I could find those Super 8 videos I took back then. So that was quite a deal that day. The ship is anchored. The ship is adrift. 
something you never want to hear. And then finally the ship was anchored again. So that's my little sea story. I don't know if you guys would like to hear more sea stories. I've got all sorts of them. I spent 18 months on that aircraft carrier, two cruises. First cruise was towards a year because of the 1973 Israeli crisis. We were all the way up into Edinburgh, Scotland, ready to leave and go back to Norfolk, and we got extended because of the 1973 Israeli crisis. And my second cruise was about six months before they flew me back from the Mediterranean to be discharged. Let me know if you like sea stories. Boy, I have got hundreds of them. <laughs> have a good one. Thanks, guys.